What if the common understanding of Lebesgue versus Riemann integration has been missing the point? It's often explained as partitioning the y-axis instead of the x-axis, as if it's some profound geometric revolution. But that's not what really matters. The path to understanding will be constructive. We'll build new concepts from the ground up. But the end result will be much simpler, far more intuitive and truly elegant. Let's start with what Riemann integration really means. Fairness across space. The key principle is simple. Every uniform sequence must give the same average. Not just some sequences, every single one. In one dimension, we have the familiar formula. The integral over f over the integral a to b equals the length of the interval times the limit of the average. Take any uniform sequence on the interval, evaluate the function at each point and compute the average. Every uniform sequence should converge to the same value. Now extend this to d dimensions. Instead of length, we use volume of q. Instead of an interval, we use a uniform sequence at any hyperbox q. The principle remains the same. Fairness across the space means every uniform sequence gives the same answer. If this feels like a quick review, the previous video in the series covers the foundations in detail. For now, we will assume these principles are understood and move forward. Remember the Dirichlet function. 1 on the irrationals, 0 on the rationals. Earlier we used the strict Riemann approach. If different uniform sequences give different averages, they declare it not integrable, period. But here's the geometric node that changes kind of everything. The rationals are countable. They form a dust scattered thinly. The irrationals on the other side are uncountable. They fill the space. Can we judge equality up to this tiny set of rationals? Or can we be more lenient, but still sensible. Our first goal is to formalize what tiny set means. The idea, cover the set by small pieces. If we can make the total volume as small as we like, the set is negligible. Start with the rationals in 0, 1. Cover them with intervals. Make the intervals tighter. Keep shrinking the total length. We can make the sum of lengths less than any epsilon, as small as we want. The same principle generalizes to d-dimensions using boxes instead of intervals. Here's the formal definition. A set E in the d-dimensional real space is negligible if for all epsilon greater than zero, there exist countably many boxes Qj such that E is contained in their union and the sum of volumes is less than epsilon. Two functions are equal almost everywhere, abbreviated AE, if the set where they differ is negligible. Back to our Dirichlet function. It equals the constant 1 almost everywhere on the interval 0, 1. The rationals where they differ are negligible. So are we done? We can now ignore negligible sets. Maybe that's all the back integration is. Riemann integration defined almost everywhere. Not quite. Here's the counterexample. The fat canter set. Start with the interval 0, 1. Remove the middle quarter and open interval. From each remaining piece, remove the middle quarter and repeat this forever. Let's calculate the total length removed. 1 quarter plus 2 pieces of 1 16th plus 4 pieces of 1 64th and so on. Now we can factor out 1 quarter. So we get 1 quarter times the series 1 plus 1 half plus 1 quarter and so on. A geometric series that sums, as you should know, to 2. So in total we removed one half. So the remaining set, which we call the fat canter set, has length one half. Any sensible integral should give us one half. But, and here's the problem, this set is not Riemann integrable, 
even almost everywhere. Here's the issue. We can create two different uniform sequences that give completely different averages for the fat canter set. For example, type A has points mostly in the gaps and converges here to 0.2. And type B has points mostly in the canter pieces and converges here to 0.8. But here's what makes this truly problematic. This isn't just a problem at one scale. If we zoom in, the fractal structure repeats. No matter how deep we go, we keep finding the same issue. Sequences that converge to different values. Even removing negligible sets doesn't help here. The problem persists at every scale. So we need a better approach. But there's hope. Maybe these pathological sequences, the ones that cause problems, are themselves negligible. Think about it. Uniform sequences form a vast space. Perhaps the problematic ones are just a tiny negligible subset, like finding a needle in an infinite haystack. If that's true, we could simply exclude them and get a consistent integral definition. Here's the key insight. We don't have a notion of negligible sets of sequences, only of negligible sets in d-dimensional real space. So we need a bridge, a mapping from points in space to uniform sequences. We call this a uniform sequence generator. For each starting point x0 in d-dimensional real space, the generator produces a distinct uniform sequence. Now, negligible sets make sense. A negligible set of starting points gives us a negligible set of sequences. The question is, does such a generator exist? It's surprisingly simple. Irrational rotation. In one dimension, start at any point x0 on the circle, rotate by an irrational angle alpha each step, take the fractional part, that's your sequence. The modular one operation is just the continuous rotation robbed back to the interval. In d dimensions, it's similar. Use d independent irrational numbers. This means no integer combination equals another integer combination except the trivial one. Now compare dependent versus independent alphas. Dependent alphas form lines. They are not uniform. Independent alphas fill the space uniformly. This is our generator. Irrational rotations with independent alphas. Let's verify this generator actually works. First property, uniformity. We generate 2000 points using irrational rotation. Watch how they fill the square. Now let's test specific regions. The lower half, the running average, converges to exactly 0.5 as expected. The upper right quarter converges to 0.25. Perfect. Even this tiny upper left region, a sixteenth of the total, converges to a sixteenth. The sequence is truly uniform. Every region gets its proportional share of points. Second property, distinctness. Consider two sequences x0 and y0. If y0 equals x0 plus some multiple of alpha, they are equivalent, just shifted versions. After discarding the first few terms, they overlap perfectly. The points coincide. But if y0 doesn't have this relationship with x0, the sequences are truly distinct. The points never coincide the sets are disjoint. This is crucial. Irrational rotation creates uncountably many distinct uniform sequences. Irrational rotation works for any hyperbox cube, not just the unit cube. Start with uniform points in the unit cube. Now scale and translate the box itself. Watch the points transform too. The uniform distribution in the unit cube becomes a uniform distribution in Q. This is the key. By scaling and translating, irrational rotation becomes a uniform sequence generator for every hyperbox Q. Now we can solve the fat canter problem. Recall, 
As we generate more points using our deterministic sequence, the proportion that fall inside the Cantor set on intervals should approach one half. But with arbitrary uniform sequences, we couldn't guarantee this. Now, using irrational rotation, for every starting point x0, the sequence is uniformly distributed in the space. But for almost every x0, meaning for all except a negligible set, the sequence not only spreads out uniformly, but also converges to the correct limit. Watch the convergence. Multiple sequences all converging to the same value. As we add more points, even zooming into the fractal structure, they all converge to one half. The problem is solved. By using a structure generator and removing a negligible set, we get consistent, well-defined integration. We set out to fix our problem with the Riemann integral. But what we gained was the largest possible class of functions for which two key properties hold together. Linearity. The integral of a linear combination equals the linear combination of the integrals. Both Riemann and Lebesgue have this. And the monotone convergence theorem. If functions increase to a limit, their integrals increase to the integral of the limit. Watch the step functions approximate the parabola. The integral of f1 to f2 to f3 to f4 converges to the integral of the limit. For Riemann integration, monotone sequences can fail. The limit might not be Riemann integrable. Lebesgue integration is the maximal extension where both linearity and monotone convergence hold. These properties together make Lebesgue integration incredibly powerful for analysis. So here's the formal definition. A function f from q to the real numbers is Lebesgue integrable if and only if there exists a negligible subset n of q such that for all starting points x0 outside n, where xn is from irrational rotation with start x0, possibly scaled and translated, the limit of 1 over n, the sum of f of xn, equals sum l. Then we define the integral of f over q equals l. This is the Lebesgue integral. Two quick remarks. First, about the notation mu. Mu is called the Lebesgue measure. It can be defined exactly as we defined volume for Riemann, but using Lebesgue integrable functions. It's the natural measure that comes from this integration theory. Second, about irrational rotation. It is not the only possible generator. There are others, but irrational rotation is the most straightforward and simple one. It's the natural choice for introducing these ideas. Let's step back and compare Riemann versus Lebesgue. Both use the same test, the limit of 1 over n sum f of xy. But Riemann tests with all uniform sequences. Every single one must converge to the same value. This is incredibly strict. If even one sequence gives a different answer, the function is not Riemann integrable. Lebesgue is smarter. We test only with a structured subset, sequences from a irrational rotation. And for each function, we are allowed to remove a negligible set, one that can depend on the function itself. It's flexible, yet still meaningful. Both approaches still use uncountably many tests, but Lebesgue's tests are well chosen. Structured plus flexible beats exhaustive and rigid. Next, we'll move beyond bounded boxes, extending our integration approach to all of real space. We also look at something we set aside. Riemann integration is direction dependent. The integral from A to B is not the same as the integral from B to A. This orientation sensitivity has deep geometric meaning. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more in this series on integration theory.